run out of some fellows who are coming up from where? Jimmy Swaggart. Did you come? Have they here? No. About two weeks they got lost. <laughs> <coughs> okay, Hebrews 11. And remember again that this is the faith chapter. And the word occurs, what, 300 times in the New Testament and only twice in the Old Testament. The key in this chapter is faith. But the key verse is verse 6. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. To them that diligently seek him. Let me recite that again. Verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. Notice that? Doesn't say without education. Doesn't even say without Bible knowledge. You know, we're putting such an emphasis today on Bible knowledge. And yet the, the, the Word of God does not say that people that do know their Bibles, it says that people that do know their God shall be exploits. Boy, if Bible knowledge could change the world, we'd have changed it months ago. We're reeking with Bible knowledge. As I tell you, you could, you could put a four-lane highway from Detroit to the Gulf of Mexico with tapes. Christian tapes, there's so many of them around. But they don't do much. The people that do know their God should be strong. Okay, let's go back into the Old Testament. Let me see where I want to go here. Into Genesis chapter what? Let me see. Genesis chapter 11. Let's read at verse, verse 30 of chapter 11. <coughs> Sarah was barren and she bare no child. And Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot the son, and Lot, and Lot the son of Haran and son's son, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. They went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in heaven. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred. This is a demand. Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy... You see, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Getting out of your country may not be too difficult. Getting away from your family is. All you have to do is to tell your daddy and mommy you're going to the mission field, they'll have a relapse, they'll die nearly. Of course, if there's a war, and you say, well, I can't imagine Jesus as a machine gun mopping people down, and I can't do it. I can't fight on the battlefield. Oh, you better do that. You've been disgraced to the family. We're very, very quick to keep people from going to the mission field, but get out and serve your country. That may be right, I don't know. But what about serving the Christ? But you see, the basis of true Christianity is sacrifice. An experience of God that costs nothing, is worth nothing, and it does nothing. And if you want to graduate with a double zero, that's it. Be nervous about God. Don't believe that God is. Don't believe Hebrews 7.25, he's able to save to the uttermost. Don't believe that he's able to make all grace abound. Don't believe he's able to keep you from falling. It's just a piece of paper. You see what these men did? They really believed God. Doesn't it later say in the scripture, Abraham believed God. And he was accounted to him, for, and all that came out of him was because of one thing, he believed God. That God is able to make all grace abound, that God is able to guide me, O oh, thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. You see, the trouble is this world isn't barren to many people now. It's supplies of everything in luxury, luxuriating. <coughs> the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country. That's number one. From thy father's and from thy kindred, number two, and from thy father's house, to a land that I will show thee. Now that's the demand. But look at the reward. Next verse, I will make of thee. Next line, I will bless thee. And then I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And verse three, 
I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall the families of all the earth be blessed. And verse 4, Abraham was 75 years old. Isn't that something? 75 years old. And you think the Lord's late in calling you. Maybe he's waiting to get rich enough to smash all the crutches you lean on. 75 years of age. The Lord is not slack and saying his promises. Okay. 75 years of age, God called him. 175, God finished working on him. So cheer up, you have a long way to go. Just one more century. Well, doesn't it say in the 10th chapter of Hebrews that you have need of patience after you've done the will of God? What happened to Noah that we described last week? Noah built his ark for 120 years, which we worked out the amount of it without any on that little computer, computer she carried. It was a million and a half hours from the time he started to the time he... And then you think God was impatient. 120 years building the ark. What was it? 38,400 hours. One and a half million. No. 38 and a half. No, what, what was it? 38,400 hours. No, it wasn't. What was it? Days. Days and uh, a million and a half hours. Do you wonder the word of God says the patience of God, the long suffering of God, waiting, waiting, waiting. He's very slow, but as someone said, God is never in a hurry, <coughs> but he's never late either. He keeps the scorecard and he keeps the timetable. And nobody hurries God. I've got to do some spots through here. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. The Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and appeared un God appeared unto him. Time and time again this man is building an altar. Remember we said about the first man in Hebrews 11 was who? Abel. What did he do? He built an altar. For why? To worship and sacrifice. So Abel built an altar. The next character is Enoch. He walked with God. And we stress that. Abraham walked with God. Adam walked with God. You have one of the outstanding stories in the New Testament of the men on the Emmaus Road. What were they doing? Miracles? No, they walked with God. And that's the greatest thing in the whole world. Not the exploits that we do, but to know that day by day we're walking in step with God. We're not behind Him. We're not before Him. We're walking according to the dictates of His Spirit for our individual lives. Let's go down to the chapter now. Verse 10. There was a famine in the land, and Abraham went into Egypt. What in the world did he go there for? Well, his resources were running out, so he went and borrowed from Egypt. The land had had a curse on it. You remember that Cain slew Abel, his brother. Why? Because Abel's sacrifice was accepted. The sacrifice Cain brought was cursed because it was out of the ground that God had cursed. We've got to be very careful about the offerings we make. I remember some years ago in England, a young man held a, a crusade in a country church. And he met one of his college friends. He said, uh, well, how was your crusade? Anybody saved? He said, uh, yes, uh, two and a half. Well, that's good. He said, two adults and a child. He said, no, two children and an adult. What do you mean, two and a half? He said, that man, half of his life was already spent. So he's only half. We look at the other way, don't we? There was one of the gr smallest crusades ever held in England, again in a village, and a man by the name of Thomas Cook, you remember he wrote the book New Testament Holiness, and after three weeks, you know, the gray, gray beards met together, and they said, well, what's come out of this crusade? It cost us so much in lighting, it cost us a heating, it cost in love offering, it cost in travel expenses. Now, what are we to show for it? Oh, just one boy called Thomas Cook. Oh, you know that widow lady? She has one son, 14 years of age, Thomas Cook, and he's not very bright. He's retarded. Thomas Cook became the president of the Methodist Church and the founder of the college I went to. Not much to look at. What was it? F well, it doesn't matter who it was, anyhow. I was going to give you the name, it doesn't matter. 
But the, the point that says ill, ill that he blesses is our good, and none blessed good is ill, and all is right that seems most wrong, if it be his sweet will. Or Madame Gin says, could I be cast where thou art not? That were indeed a dreadful spot. But with thee, my God, to guide the way, tis equal joy to go or stay. All right, verse 10 of Genesis 12. <clears throat> there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous. It came to pass that he came near to enter into the city. Sarah, his wife, he said to her, Sarah, behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. She was a lovely blonde. And verse 12 says, Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall say to thee, they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me and save thee alive. So what happens? Say, I pray thee, that thou art my sister. You see, here's this superman. What's the first thing he does? He makes the mistake, he goes to Egypt. But if you read the seventh chapter, you must read it after. Don't read them now. Read the fourth chapter of Romans. It's all about this amazing man, Abraham. Read the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles about Abraham. What does it say? The God of glory. Lest we forget it, the God of glory, the God of super majesty, appeared to our... What do you call it now? Let me read it correctly. From the good version, of course. Acts chapter 7, verse 1. Then said the high priest of these things so, and he said, Men and brethren, the fathers hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. In other words, that was a hell hole. It was an enlarged uh, type of, of uh, well, Sodom, which was a type, of course, or today we say Las Vegas, and all that filth rolled into it. And yet the God of glory comes when he's in a horrible city. In Mesopotamia, the God of glory appeared unto Abraham. You see, there's no way you can predict where God is going to come. Moses goes on the backside of the desert, and God of glory appeared unto him in a bush. Somewhere he was at a banquet, I think. He was at a banquet with the kings and lords and ladies of the earth, and somebody said, you know, Moses is stargazing. Sure he was. You know what he was doing? He was looking into heaven. He was seeing the glory of God. Not in a Bible sense. Because we're no Bibles. But there he is, in the strangest place, the God who appeared to Abraham appears to Moses at a burning bush and appears to him somewhere in a banquet. What did it say? Because it says in Hebrews there, he was supposed to be the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. And what did he do? He had a vision of what? Well, he had a vision of the glory of God. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God than enjoy the pleasures. Oh, we sing, you know, for thee all the follies of sin. Forget it. Sing the scripture. For thee all the pleasures of sin are resigned. Of course there's pleasure in sin, but it only lasts for a, mo a moment. People don't borrow money to go to Las Vegas and have, have all the thrills. To sit there miserable, boy, they laugh and cry and carry on. But it lasts for the night. Fading is the sinner's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show. Solid joys and lasting pleasure, none but Zion's children know. And Abraham cho and Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin, which are good for a season. Well, where did he see the pleasures of God? Somewhere when he was in some tremendous experience there in Egypt. Come in, welcome. Let me find my scripture here in a minute.
chapter 20 of Genesis, I think, chapter 20 and verse 14. What did Abraham say? He said, when you go into the city, they're going to look at you, and they're going to say, that beautiful blonde, get her right to the king's harem right away. What did he do first? His first mistake was to go down into Sodom, into Egypt. Why? Because a bit later it says, when he gave a choice to Lot, young Lot, looked to the north, the south, the east and the west, and he looked out to the well-watered plains of Jordan, and it says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. The next moment he's in Sodom. The next moment he's the king of Sodom. The next moment he's out of Sodom, bankrupt. But why did he go to Sodom? Why did he pitch his tent towards Sodom? Because he said it looks like unto Egypt. Well, who took him to Egypt? His godly uncle. Don't you blame God or anybody else if you buy your youngsters a TV for their own bedroom, you leave them alone, they'll take all the junk there is. They'll get lustful and, and you'll be to blame, not them. If he'd not gone down to Egypt and seen all that was of the flesh, the world of flesh and the devil, the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, he'd never have pinched towards Sodom. But he went towards Sodom. He lived in Sodom. He sat in the gate. I used to wonder when he, as a kid, when the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, you think, well, who's going to carry the gates around? The gate is symbolic of government. The government met in the gate. And he sat in, Lot sat in the gate, the word of God says. But then you get this amazing thing that's said about in Joshua chapter 24. <coughs> and verse 2. Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and what? And they served other gods. So what happens? God says, Get thee up out of thy country. You see, there are things you can't do to do today they did in the, in the Bible days. Let me tell you what it says here. In chapter 13 and verse 1 it says, Abraham went out of Egypt, he, his wife, and all he had and lot with him. And Abraham was very rich in cattle and in silver and in gold. He's very, very wealthy. And he says to the cowboys, round up the cows, bring up the cattle. And he's living, I, I, I used to be able to do it, I can't, let's say it, it's down here in Earl of the Chaldees. So he's going up to Earl of the Chaldees. And here's a river called the river... You won't guess what river that is. The river Euphrates. If he's going to go up there, which he did, then come down into Palestine, or as, as it was called in those days, it's all those cattle, he's all those other things to take, he has to keep them alive. Now you go down the road tomorrow, say tonight the Lord says, I want you to get up and go and live south. Even if you only two or three cows and a couple of pigs, go down the road, you get arrested for being on the main road. Abraham takes all he has and sets off on the journey. Not knowing whither he went, the word of God says. Let's look at the seventh chapter of Acts a minute here. In chapter 7, verse 3, And the Lord said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I will show thee. He came out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charon, or Charon from thence. And when his father was dead, when his father was dead, what's he doing there? What did God say to him? Look at the 51st, was it, 53rd chapter in Isaiah, I think it is. No, 50, pardon me, 51. Isaiah 51. Hearken unto me, verse 1, hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock from when she are hewn, and to the hole of the pit from when she are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I call him, what? Alone. I called him alone, and blessed him and increased him. I called him alone. Did he go alone? 
No, he didn't. He took the rest of the family with him. What's the penalty? Let me go back a moment there. I skip these things, as you know well enough. Exodus, where were we? I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Wrong chapter. Genesis. Genesis again, verse 13, uh, 13 of chapter 12. Say, I pray thee, that thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Okay. And so she went in there. But I'm thinking of a scripture that, you remember, he says that, uh, well, he says, say you're my sister. Well, she was his half-sister. And there's another scripture I can't just remember at the moment that says, she was born of my father, but not of my mother. She was his half-sister. So he was telling half of the truth, but he was making it convenient for himself because he's in enemy territory. And so he says, well, she's my sister. So what happened? You can't hide sin. You can cover it over, do what you like, but your sin will, if it isn't found out, and don't swallow the idea that someday that sin you buried will be found out. It may not till the judgment seat. It will find you out. It will wake up at night and haunt you. I remember a, a story that Shalemi used to tell of a man that was killed in New Jersey, working a night shift, and a man hit him with a shovel and killed him and then threw him into a furnace. And for 12 years that man was haunted, and finally... Away in California, he woke up one night screaming, I did it, I did it, I can see his eyeballs. And he told the detectives, I've seen that man's head fall back when I threw him feet first in the furnace. His eyeballs were reflecting like mirrors. And he said, every day of my life, I've seen those rolling eyeballs. Now his sin was not found out, it found him out. There are more people suffering from all kinds of nervous complaints away in California than anywhere at all. And a leading psychiatrist said recently, most of them are suffering from guilt. They call it some other name. They've covered it. And it comes because of sin. So what happens? This beautiful lady goes into the harem. What's the result? Verse 17, the Lord plagued the house of Pharaoh with great plagues because of Sarah. Now Sarah had nothing to do with it. Abraham allowed her to be deceitful. And he told a lie. So you've got a man that God uses that went to Egypt got his nephew contaminated, tells a lie to get out of trouble, so there's another big mistake. Again, I've told you, these people in Hebrews 11 are old, but by no means are they perfect characters. I wouldn't have put Noah in, he got drunk. I wouldn't put Abraham in, he was a liar. I wouldn't put David in, he was an adulterer, but they're all in Hebrews 11. I sure wouldn't put a harlot in, but God did. He talks about Rahab the harlot. Moses, he's a murderer. I would have put characters in the down there. I would have put Enoch. I would have put Elijah. He isn't there. I told you why that old lady told me. But anyhow, there are other characters. I would have put uh, Joshua. He's there by inference, by faith. The walls of Jericho fell down. Well, who was the captain? Joshua. Good night. What good is, what's the good of being humble if you don't tell people about it? They'll never be suspicious, will they? Okay. <clears throat> Let's skip over this now into the 14th chapter. And verse 9. Verse 9 has one of those big wonderful names. Chedorlaomer, the king of Elam, with the title king of nations. And Amraphael, the king of Shinar. And Ariok, the, the king of El Alatha. For the battle of the four kings against five. And it says the valley of Sidim was full of slime pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, remember those cities, the capital cities of iniquity, had a government 
They had kings. They had everything set up like we have today. And yet they were like us today, they were fighting. Verse 11 says, they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and their peoples and went away. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, and dwelt in Sodom and Gods and departed. And there came one that escaped and told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother Eshcol and brother Anna, and these were confederate with Abraham. What did he do when he heard that his brother was taken captive? What did he say? Oh, that's Lot, the stupid Lot. I told him about, you see, when there came a woman of choice, Abraham says, that the, in chapter 13 and verse 6, they, they so prospered according to the promise of God, the land wasn't able to bear the weight of them. And so there was strife between Abraham's uh, servants and Lot's servants. And so Abraham, good old Abraham says, Lot, well, do you know what Lot was? He was a bad Lot. Because when, the, when Abraham said, choose this side of the valley and I'll take that side, he looked to the plains and he said, oh, I'm going to take that. Who's going to take those mountains? Well, the grass is so short that the sheep would have to kneel down to, grass, to eat it. But look at the lush valley, look at the water, everything here will make me prosperous. And so he chose the well-watered plains. He chose everything according again to the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh. Everything for me. You see, a simple definition of love is that love desires the supreme best for the person it loves. I go out of the picture. I do everything for that one I love. So Abraham says, well, myself, he always says, Sarah, did you ever see anything? Think of this little twerp we have with us. If we'd have left him in the old country, he'd have been a slave. We looked after him, educated him, clothed him. And now he's a smart businessman, he's taking stocks and bonds, and he's got the land, he's got everything he wants. And Abraham goes on a ball mountain. But when God is going to speak, what does he do? Well, he does what all true friendship does. He says, shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I do? And when the word of God says he won't hide anything from the eyes of the prophet, I don't think that means you have visions in the night and dreams. It means that God has revealed through his word. Be up to date with the word of God and find out what's going on. Abram heard that his brother was taken captive. He armed his trained servants. Born in his own house, 318. Dear Lord, if I had 18, I think he was a pretty tall guy. 318 servants. Good night. Paying insurance for that crowd would be a lot, wouldn't it, Sonny? Do you have as many as that? No, you don't. 318 servants. Abraham doesn't say that young guy needs to learn his lesson. Let him, let him get scalped. Let him lose his money. What did he do? He took what? 318 servants that were raised in his own house. He didn't send for mercenaries. He didn't say go out and ask fellows to become soldiers in the fight. He had trained 318 servants and they knew their master and they loved him and they went out and fought the battle and won it. Do you know what? If every church was really a church, even the evangelical church, if we really taught the word of God, we wouldn't need Bible schools. Why should people have to go to church till they're 25 years of age? They go to a Bible school. That's a disgrace to the church. You know, the Roman Catholic kids, the Roman Catholic slogan is this, give us a child, till it's seven years of age, we'll cut it loose on the world and they'll never go into anything else. That's why it's so hard to win them. They're indoctrinated about the Virgin Mary. They're indoctrinated about, uh, uh, what do you call it? Purgatory. They know the doctrine. They don't know the Word of God, but they know their doctrine. And in some ways, they're steadfast and unmovable. So here is a sample for us. That's why I say, because it's always, when you get to my age, when you have most of the wisdom, any have but... Uh, you realize what a fool you'd be. If I could go back, I think I'd take a dozen men like Jesus did and say, you come for three years and we're going to go through the Word of God and you're going to go through the mill as well. You're going to have nights of prayer and days of fasting, read church history, by the grace of God, make some history. As I tell you, I'm sick to death of reading church history. Let's make it by the grace of God. But he took his 318 servants and he wiped the mob out and he got this young fellow back again. Now look at verse 17. 
the king of Sodom went out to meet him. That is, he went out to meet Abraham after the slaughter of that king, whoever he was. And the kings that were with him in the valley of Sheba. Verse 18, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, went forth, brought bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, that is, he blessed Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God. Isn't that great? Huh? He didn't say that smart guy that lives up on the hill there. You see, when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't go to the mayor of the town. He didn't go to the judge in the gate by the name of Lot. He went to the man praying on the mountain. The man that hadn't got a dime invested in Sodom and Gomorrah. The man that was considered old and archaic. He's always building altars. He's always praying. He's always interceding. Well, if you're going to be a f wise in the eyes of the world, you'll be a fool. No, if you're going to be wise in the eyes of God, you'll be a fool in the eyes of the world. You can't have it both ways. But which empire is going to last? You sang it tonight, I trapped you. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, ages and ages. If there were a thousand eternities, Jesus Christ would still be living. There are not a thousand eternities, there's one. Because eternity is duration without ages, cycles of ages. It goes on and on and on. There's no end at all. And he shall reign forever and ever. How many of you have a record of the Messiah? Let me see. Two? Three? Well, now you know what to buy your wife for Christmas. Get a good recording of the Messiah from England if you can get it. I mean, uh, <laughs> an English version. There's one of the London Philharmonic and it's super. You know, when they start singing King of Kings Nation and they go up and up and up, I think, good Lord, they'll all break down. <laughs> and it's just awesome to hear and he shall reign forever and ever. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we have this wonderful example here. Okay. The man said, blessed, verse 19 of chapter 14, blessed, he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham, the, the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Isn't that great? Not that Abraham possessed heaven and earth, God did. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We kind of think somebody's taking it over temporarily. Not at all. The earth is the Lord's and he's, come, he's going to gather all the spoil one day. Verse 22, Abraham said to the king of Sodom, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Verse 20, blessed be the most high God which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods for thyself. Now listen, Abraham said, I've lifted my hand unto the Lord, most high God, possess in heaven, I will not take a thread even to a shoe latch it. This multimillionaire, king of the, of the richest country in the world offers to give all the money to Abraham he wants and he says I won't touch a damn thing there's damnation over all of it I won't even take a pair of shoestrings from you and yet one big boy full of the Holy Ghost took over a million dollars of the filthiest filth in the world what is the word of God called filthy lucre and the filthiest of filthy lucre comes from casinos and race courses and dog tanks and that guy takes over a million filthy dollars, tear-stained, fear-stained, blood-stained, sin-stained dollars as an answer to prayer. That's blasphemy. I'd like the chance to tell him face to face. This man says, I will not take any servant. I will not use anybody that isn't trained in my own house. It should be by the time a pastor has been in a church five years, he's got so trained his deacons that any of them can fill the bill any time either way. That's their job to do. Not to stand at the door Sunday morning, so sweet, with a little buttonhole in, you know. Nice little flower there, and lead old ladies down the aisle. And lead everybody else astray. <laughs> <laughs> no, his job is to know the Word of God. Amen. You see, the man who invested everything that he had in Sodom lost everything. Yet Abraham is not rich and increased in goods. All right, verse 23, I will not take even a shoe latchet of anything that is then, lest thou should say, I have made Abraham rich. You see, what poor old old Roberts did, you know, he did. 
He didn't just stain his hand, he put a zipper on his mouth. Do you know why? Because the year before he took that money, he opposed the establishing of a horse racing track in Oklahoma. He opposed state, uh, state horse racing. Well, once he took gambling money, he couldn't say a word. He couldn't oppose it again. He, he sold himself for a million dollars. Dear God, I wouldn't sell myself for all the money in Fort Knox or Fort anywhere else. Perishing things of clay, born but for one brief day, A.B. Simpson said. Or if you like, you don't know the hymn, maybe, All for Jesus, All for Jesus. Know that hymn? Do you know it? All for Jesus, All for Jesus, All my beings, ransom powers. And at the standard says, Worldlings prize their gems of beauty, cling to gilded toys and dust, boast of wealth and fame and pleasure, only Jesus will I trust. It finishes with this amazing thing, Oh, what wonder, how amazing. Jesus, glorious King of Kings, deigns to call me his beloved, lets me rest beneath his wings. All for Jesus, all my beings, ransom powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days, and all, all for Jesus. Oh yes, you used to say a lot a few years ago, oh, only one life will soon be passed, but that's not what the poet wrote. The poet wrote, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for God will last, but when I am dying, how glad I shall be that the lamp of my life has been burned out today. That is my dear friend Jim symbol of the Brooklyn Tabernacle uses the phrase often, that's where the rubber meets the road. Of course, you remember that lovely old hymn, Abide With Me, Fast Falls the Even Tide? The last stanza says what? Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning, heaven's morning, heaven's morning breaks and earth vain shadows flee. Oh, thou who change, changest not abide with me. I don't like that idea, but anyway, hold out thy cross before my closing eyes. The Catholic says, oh, hold the crucifix before my closing eyes. Some people die, oh, when I die, put my Bible in my casket. And some do, and some are too stingy to do that. Do you think the man that's dying of AIDS says, put six copies of, 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 of Playboy in my casket? I don't want to hold a crucifix. I want to hold a picture of Marilyn Monroe or some girl. Of course he doesn't. That's, where the, that's again where the rubber meets the road. Everything falls if we're not founded in Jesus Christ. Swift to its close ebbs about life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Oh, that wonderful American hymn that says, uh, My faith looks up to thee. The last stanza says, When ends life's transient dream? Ladies in England, you, a lady came to our church. We had one rich lady. She was a pest. <laughs> she had a fur coat made of, a, I don't know many in America, I understand, a mole. A mole is very much like a rat, but it has a very silken coat. And she had a gorgeous... I did that too. One lady said, a, a, a coat made of rat skins, okay. <laughs> but she had this, this lovely coat. But you know, the amazing thing about a mole is it's blind until it dies. Immediately they hit them to kill them, their eyes open. You know, that's tragically true of most people. They're living in a dream. When ends life's transient dream? When death's cold, sullen stream shall o'er me roll. Blessed Saviour, then in love, fear and distress removed. Oh, bear me safe above the ransom soul. I will not take him to a shulachet. Let me take one more thing and skip, then skip over this. Chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, after this battle, after the time that this man has proved himself, the word of the Lord came unto him. Notice that, read the story, the word of the Lord came unto him. A vision from the Lord came unto him. The word of the Lord came unto him saying, in a vision saying, Abraham, fear not, I am thy shield. What did he say? I'll give you a shield? No. I am thy shield. Look, if God is a shield between me and that circumstance, what chance has it of getting to me? As long as I live in a place of obedience, 
And that's the whole secret of Abraham's life, like everybody else. Trust and obey, there's no other way. And God, the Almighty God, says, oh, he hangs the stars in space, and he can scramble them when he wants. Do you remember what it says in the Old Testament? The stars in their courses fought against Israel. One night God scrambled the stars to drive a, an earthly king crazy. He made the stars, those heavenly friends. Read the 40th of Isaiah. Quit reading Romans 8.28 every day when you're down. Forget it. You'll wear the page out. Read, read Isaiah chapter 40. What does it say there? It talks about the hosts of heaven. And I think it was Isaac Watts. By the way, a fellow called me today. Do you know what? He said, I've got all the hymns of Isaac Watts and his poetry all... Uh, printed for you and bound. Boy, that's going to be wonderful. So you'll be hearing some poetry. Isaiah 40 talks about the Lord and the stars. He made them all. And he, he calls them by name. So what says he made the stars, those heavenly flames? He counts their numbers, calls their names. You know, I love to hear that little strutting, arrogant puppy. What's his name? Paul Sagan or so? Carl Sagan, yes. Poor retarded guy. <laughs> from and about those galaxies. They've just found galaxies with billions and billions and billions and billions of stars. <laughs> it reminds me of somebody wrote a bit of dogger about a, a cocky scientist years ago. <coughs> and the point, I can't give you the first part, but it breaks off like this. Uh, he can tell you when the caterpillar first began to wonder when it would become a man. Can let us know within a million years when it was when it was founded with, a, with a, a pair of ears. Indignant we reply with holy ire, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. So Sagan says there are billions of great. You can get a, a little chip as big as my finger and I'm told you can put 150,000 things on that little chip in a computer. You know, I believe this stupid thing being stupid. I don't have to struggle with stupid, stupid, it's natural. <coughs> I believe God knows how many grains of sand there are in the universe, how many blades of grass, how many trees, how many leaves on trees. Sure he does. He made the stars those heavenly flames. He counts their numbers, calls their names. His wisdom's vast and knows no bound. A deep where all our thoughts are drowned. What is the creature's skill or force to God? Does he look at monkeys and laugh? Does he watch horses run? What is the creature's skill or force? The sprightly man, the warlike horse, the piercing wit, the active limb? All are too mean delights for him, but saints are lovely in his sight. God get more out of you getting victory over sin today than Gabriel. He gets more out of every triumph we have than all the eternal concourse. There are billions of angels, I don't care. He's redeemed us. When we walk in the light, no, they, and that gives pleasure to God. We're made here to, to give pleasure to God. <coughs> well, the next chapter, let me just skip over this quickly. Chapter 15 and verse 6 again says, And Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him. Read that chapter, Romans 4. It says there, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It's not because of his exploits, it's because he believed God. God is righteous, God is faithful, I believe God. You know, five minutes inside of heaven, we'll all be embarrassed to death. I kind of was looking at the end of the journey, looking back and said, you see, there's your track. That's where you miss blessing. That's where you almost, you almost came into fullness. That's where I was going to lead you, into a major triumph in your life, and you missed it. I have to get one thing there, let me say it quickly and not look about too much. God blessed Abraham when he obeyed God. But do you know what he did? Once he listened to his wife, and the Lord didn't speak to him for 15 years after that. So watch out, brother. <laughs> if the Lord isn't talking to you, maybe you listen to your wife too often. Oh, but let's skip that. <laughs> Okay, let's look at verse 9. He said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years, and a ram three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took him unto all these, and divided them in the midst. And each piece, one against the other, the birds he divided not. 
when the fowls came down upon the, the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Listen, I don't care what my sacrifice you make. I don't care you, whether you're emotional or not emotional. You can be cool intellectually and make a super decision for God. And the next morning the birds of there will come and try and take away your sacrifice. You have to beat them off. Drive them off. Every inch of progress that you get in favor with God, you get into disfavor with the devil. Every step of area he loses in your life enrages the devil. He's not concerned about the stock market going up and down. Lots of believers are, but he isn't. He does not want us to be completely faithful to the living God. That's what antagonizes the devil. The sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon him, and then a horror of great darkness fell upon him. What do we read? Abraham, the friend of God. I sent a poem to somebody this week. Uh, I'm trying to think how it starts. Well, part of it is, uh, I'd rather walk in the dark with God than walk alone with light. In the light, I'd rather walk by faith with Him than go alone by sight. Oh, blissful lack of wisdom, tis blessed not to know. Sure it is. We sing a hymn sometime, abide with me. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see the distance seen. One step enough for me. Look, if God gave you the chance of having the veil lifted in your life to see the next five years, do you think you have enough courage to take it? Abraham was. He was a great friend of God. We draw the birds away at the end of verse 11. Verse 12. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know the surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. Listen now. And shall serve them, and they shall afflict your children for 400 years. What if I came to you tonight and said, last night, well I do, I go to bed about half past nine, get out about half past eleven, went in my office till two o'clock this morning, I was praying and reading. It's funny, I said to you, Lord, Lord lifted the veil and told me that two years from now, Russia is going to invade America and totally demoralize, take over everything that we have, our industry and everything, for the next fifty years. Would you like to know that? God said, your children are going into slavery for four hundred years. Not 400 weeks. They're going to be slaves for four centuries. And yet we never find Abraham backing off. He obeys God in every, every one of the circumstances. <coughs> Let's take one more thing in the 16th chapter. Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing, I pray thee, go into my maid, that I may obtain her. Here she is, talking again. And the end of the verse says what? And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. God had given him a promise. And then his wife said, you know the custom round here? If the wife is barren, you take one of the best people on the staff, have a child by her. When the child is born, you lay that child on my lap and legally the child is mine. And this man who had been forgiven for the crazy things he'd done, going to Egypt and polluting his, his nephew, and had done others, he lied and God had forgiven him. And though God says your wife will bear a son, Just for a minute, jump forward to chapter 17. Abraham was 90 years old and 9, verse 1, when the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. You see, God demands perfection. Then we say, oh, smarty, you know, we can't have Adamic perfection, we can't have angelic perfection, we can't have intellectual perfection, and we make every excuse what do you expect of your watch now? When I was a little boy, my daddy thought his watch was good because it, it only lost 15 minutes a day. Now the watches don't lose 15 seconds. They'll give you some watches now, but they guarantee we'll not lose five seconds in a year. Perfection is when a thing fulfills 
the thing for which it was commissioned. You can walk in perfection because we think perfect submission, all is at rest. rest. Perfect submission, blessed assurance, Jesus, perfect submission, all is at rest. What's the other standard with perfect in it? Oh, perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture, now verse from my, I want to fulfill whatever God has for my life up to the T. I don't want to be behind in anything. So he said, what was the chapter? I've got mixed it here. Oh, chapter 16. Verse 14, she conceived and bare a son. And when she conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. There you are. You see, you old wreck. I've borne your husband a wonderful son. And you is absolutely out of the picture. Verse 2 of that same chapter. Verse 17. Chapter 17. I will make my covenant between me and thee and multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face. And God told to him. A bit later in the chapter it says, Abraham, verse 17, when Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, it shall be done. We used to sing years ago, you won't remember it maybe. We used to sing a hymn, a, a chorus regularly. Faith, simple faith, the promise seed and looks to God alone. Laughs at impossibilities. We've more faith preachers now than ever and every blessed one of them is in debt. It's not a paradox, it's a tragedy. I had a very distinguished preacher came to see me this week, and he is a distinguished preacher. I'm an extinguished preacher. <laughs> He's a distinguished preacher. And he said, you know, all that bunch that are talking in Dallas, they're parasites on the body of America today, bleeding it for every ounce of money they can. Parasites. You don't find that in the Word of God. So what's going to happen here? Abraham fell upon his face and said, Shall a child be born of him who is a hundred years of age? And a woman who is ninety? Don't you think it was a joke? Can you imagine this dear old lady, ninety years of age, writing to her mother and saying, Mother, I'm going to have a baby. She says, What, you crackpot? I told you never to, to marry a preacher, they're all crazy. <laughs> And he's got you to believe at 90 you're going to have a baby. Come on, you're crazy. Life's at impossibilities. We want to iron it all out and reason it out and rationalize it. Make it easy for God. God doesn't need any help. Isaac Watts again wrote, wrote a little hymn. When mountain walls confront thy way, why sit and weep? Arise and say, be thou be gone, and they shall be but thy power of God cast in the sea. Be thou removed, faith bids thee start for yonder sea, arise, depart. I may, I can, I must, I will, the purpose of my God fulfill. The best thing in the world will be if every bank in America went broke next week, except for the poor people. These big boys that talk about God and don't know the first thing about God. They bled the people, they rob his children and they talk about him. As I said to you last week, we go to the house of God, we read the word of God, we sing the praise of God. Where is God? Preaching isn't preaching Christ anymore, it's lecturing. And I told you last week, if I didn't, I'll tell you now. I've said for years now, one thing that really crushes me is when I think that America has 500 evangelists and not one revivalist. Not one man that can shake a city Read the 8th chapter, not that. When you go home, read the 8th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. What's about? It's by a man by the name of Philip. And people say, well, that's another Philip. No, it says in that chapter that Paul, the apostle, went with others to the house of Philip, one of the seven. So he was one of the seven deacons. And what did he do? He did miracles and signs and wonders. Go back afterwards to the 6th chapter of Acts. What do you have a man? You have a man there by the name of what? He got stoned. Stephen, thank you. Stephen, maybe not 20 years of age, he did signs and wonders and miracles, and the rabbis and chief priests there, and the scribes and the Pharisees were angry. Here's a young man going to the city, 
And he says to a paralytic, rise and walk, and he does. He says to the blind, open your eyes, he does. He goes to where and signs and wonders were done. And the whole city was stirred. What happened? They stoned him to death. <coughs> and he had a greater triumph in his death. Because all that bunch of hypocrites there said that Christ, we, we stoned him. We know his sepulchre, he's dead. And when they were crushing the ribs, one rock hits this young man on the chest, you can hear his ribs crack. Somebody else throws a rock and it breaks his arm. Somebody else hits him in the eye, he's blind, his body's bloody and broken. And he looks, he says, I see Jesus standing. Boy, wasn't that a shock. They thought Jesus was dead in a cave up there. He said, I see Jesus standing. When? When he died, when he suffered, when he was bleeding, when he hadn't got a friend there. The greatest intellectual of the day the greatest theologian is a man called Saul of Tarsus over there, watching this young man die, never dreaming that he himself a few years after would be stoned. What do you think when a rock hit him? When he felt his ribs cracking, his body was bleeding and he's fainting. What do you think? I guess he was thinking about Stephen, the young man that was stoned to death. And you, you, you get stoned to death. If you decide to follow the Lord, if they don't crucify you physically, your friends will crucify you, other people will crucify you. And then when you get there, all your prayers of the last ten years will be answered. Heaven will open you, you'll suddenly realize the majesty of Jesus Christ. And the only way he could get you there was to break you in every other area. But we don't want it, we're glib, we think, oh, I'm crucified with Christ. We want a painless crucifixion, we want a painless Pentecost. And God doesn't play that game. Okay, so Abraham in verse 3 of chapter 17 laughed. Verse 17 of the same chapter, Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. Go across into chapter 18 and verse 12, and Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord? My Lord, there you are, ladies, watch it now. You suppose you call your husband my Lord? And you thought he was there just to empty the garbage. <laughs> He's there to be Lord and direct the house. My goodness, the ladies frowned at me then. <coughs> then verse 17 again, he says, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I do? Listen, if you want to be in line with God's will in these last days, for the God of some days, you won't be able to find pleasure even in eating. You'll be so full of sorrow and anguish. You sing, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. Well, he was a man of sorrow. We're trying to find a resurrection without dying. We're trying to find an upper room without carrying at the cross. Shall I hate? No, 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 that, God says that's not friendship. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I do? Verse 17. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed with him. Now listen, get hold of this. I was thinking of Brother Bill here when I read this today. Where's Bill? There's Bill. Where's the Indian chief? There he is. How many of you have children? Raise your hands. You have two, haven't you? Four? Wonderful. I thought you had two. You didn't have two others this week. <laughs> well, these days, you know, not, don't know what will happen. How many others have children? Good. Well, look at this verse. Nail it down in your mind. Verse 18. I know, God says, I know that he will command his children. Did you hear that? Not advise them, command them. A lady told me one day in Chicago years ago, Oh, my son isn't doing too well. Oh, oh he's all right material. He's very well off, but he's not doing very well. And she said, well, No, Mr. Rainey, I've talked to him ever since he was a tiny... I've told him about missions... I've told about the Lord, and yet he's turning away. And the scripture says, what, teach a child, and he'll not depart from it. Is that what it says, teacher? What? Train it. You like the man in the field there, and he's talking to a horse, you say, what are you doing? I'm telling this horse, he's going to win the Grand National, or he's, he's going to win the Derby next year. <laughs> and I'm going to stick a label on his rump. We're going to take them in the field, and you'll see that. No, 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 no. Those jockeys get up at four o'clock in the morning, months in and months out, year in and year out, training a horse for three years to run in whatever age it runs at. 
God said, I will bless it. Listen, the blessing of your home hangs on how you train your children. Don't blame the system that you call the school or anything else. Train your child. Be the priest in the home. And be the, be the priest and be the king in the home. Direct it with love. Shall I hide from Abraham? No. I know that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken. He can't bring it unless Abraham is faithful. He doesn't say, Abraham, you're the greatest man in the world. He was at that time. By this time, he's the greatest landowner. And God gave him all the land. But read the seventh chapter of Acts. It says he never put a foot in it. He never owned an inch of ground. And yet, ultimately, the, the earth is filled with the blessing of Abraham. What happened to Ishmael? Ask him in Washington. What are we doing? We're fighting the Arabs on every level. Hagar begat that, that child. They tried to help God out. Listen, it may look very smart. Like Abraham, he got away from the wrath of his wife for a while. Then she bear, the other girl bears a beautiful child. And now we've got millions of them. They're the curse of the earth. The Ishmaelites. You try and help God out of trouble, you'll land in trouble. You'll never, never, never get away with it. You'll heap up trouble for somebody else as well as yourself. Let me go back for a minute and then I'm going to close right here. Talking about uh, <coughs> there in that earlier chapter when, when, when Abraham says, I won't fight with anybody except those who are trained in my own house. I had a good week this week. A man came Thursday from Sweden. A big, fine, Swedish fellow. I began to ask him about his trip. Very good. He said, could I share something? He could share anything, even money. <laughs> and he didn't share any money at all. He said, Mr. Raven, only a few weeks ago, I was in Russia. I went to Leningrad, one of the greatest cities. I walked into the cathedral there. It's Greek Orthodox. And the men were there, the priests in the garments, and these were the funny hats they were. And a bunch of them to the right of the altar, standing together, they seemed to be chanting. And I went up, and I think he said, somebody struck up a hymn or something. One of these priests put his hands up like this, began to worship the Lord. So he said, oh, I thought I'd let him know that in that wicked, vile country. He said, I went to him, I put my hands on this fellow who was small, I put my hands and said, brother, I want you to know something. In America, we're praying for you. And he said, the man said, no, don't. What? No, no, no. He said, you are praying for us? We are praying for you in America. The church in America is drowning in materialism. And he said that in the heart of Russia. And I talked with a man on the phone today. Some of his friends had been in China. And he said, I told him what I'd heard. He said, well, a man coming out of China told me the same thing. They were with some Christians in a, in a home because they can't worship publicly. And this man said, look, I want you to know when I go back, I'm going to ask our church to pray for it. They said, don't bother. Your church is very to in the medicine of ours. You're just absolutely choking on materialism. I said, brother, you turn me upside down, inside out to say that. I keep praying for Russia and they don't care a hill of beans, whether we pray or not. Why should we? Going back for a minute, I was seeing the day, brother, uh, <coughs> sunny day. Not about you, but about Deacon. You know, if we're going to have revival in the memory, we'll have to put our house in order. We'll have to go to every church, particularly Pentecostal, and see if every man who's a deacon is full of faith of the Holy Ghost. If not, we're wasting time. How can we pray for purity in other churches if, if our temple is defiled? We've got to get all those guys lined up and say, are you really full of faith of the Holy Ghost? If so, do your thing. Your thing is to go out whether the priest is there or not and heal the sick and, and do the other thing and speak prophetic words. Not prophesying of the future, but speaking with an anointing of God on the thing that you're saying now. That's the only thing we're going to have, where we're going to have revival. So you've got the men there in, in that uh, 
Greek Orthodox Church praying every day. We pray for America that you may know the true religion, the true Jesus Christ. Praying for us in China. And I said to this fine young man, I said, well, I said, that must be awesome to go in. He said, it is. He said, to stand with those men. Oh, by the way, he said, this man that put his hands up. As I went out of that fabulous cathedral, somebody sat down, I looked around, and it was this priest. And he thanked me for going. I said, I put my hand in my pocket, and I brought out some small testaments in Russian. And I opened it, and as soon as the word of God, and he said he burst into tears, uncontrollable. I never thought I'd have a piece of God's holy word for myself. And he said he wiped his eyes, giving him a million dollars. Had the word of God to himself. But there's 600 million Bibles in America today for 240 million people. And most of them are on the shelf. They're gathering dust every day. People go and sing, All hail King Jesus, and they live for King's sport. All the rest of the week, about five minutes saying, All hail King Jesus. And they go to the corner and worship that dumb devil in the corner, the TV. And when they're not worshipping the king, they're worshipping his queen. His queen is called entertainment. And they're trapped in that vulgar thing. Well, brother, I said, you really shocked me what you said. Oh, I'll say something else. Oh, mercy, come on. <laughs> he said, last week I was in Portugal. You know Spain? I said, yes, Spain and Portugal. You get port wine, it comes from Portugal, that's where it came. So now you've learned something. He said, you know, Mr. Raymond, you can go down the street, Main Street in Portugal and turn to the side and have a street meeting. And he said, after you preach the word of God, and say, if you want Christ come forward, you'll get 20 to 30 people saying every meeting, I want to know Christ, I want to know Christ. Dear Lord, you couldn't give them that if you gave them a $10 ticket to come to a private meeting in America or England. But they've been in darkness so long. They've been in bondage to Rome so long. But when somebody comes along and gets marvelously transformed, and that's what the new birth is, it's not just giving up a few lousy things. It's Christ coming to live in me. The spirit that created Jesus Christ in the matrix of the Virgin Mary creates Jesus Christ. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not when I get to glory, but now. Now we're born of the spirit, washed in his blood. And he said, brother, you have you no know idea what it's been. Now here's a young man. I still is, I think in his early, 35 I think he is. And he says, you know, we have teams over there in Sweden. I sent teams. Do you know where they sent a team this summer? Oh, on the beach in Southern California. No, to Lebanon. The last place on God's earth you could get any preachers to go to. Try and get those stuffy little boys that got their degrees in Dallas Cemetery, Seminary. <laughs> you couldn't get them to go there if you give them a pension. I looked at this blonde young man, I said, well, good Lord. A miracle, do you know how he got saved? He was in jail. He was a victim of lust. He was a victim of, of drugs. He was a wreck. Big, handsome, blonde guy, a wreck. And somebody gave him a copy of... Uh, the Cross and the Switchblade in cartoon. I never thought much about cartoons. I thought they were crazy. But when he says that's all I got in jail, I thought of it, and I read it, and I prayed over it, and I was born again of the Spirit of God. So he went out and got other wretches like himself that were saved, and they formed teams. And he said, we, we've sent, every year we send at least one team behind the Iron Curtain. You know, Brother Andrews came to see me a couple of years ago. And in the course of talking, I said, well, how do you get on with young people in America? Oh, they're excited about it. They say, Mr. Bar Andrew, uh, I, I think I'd like to go to Hungary or Latvia or Estonia. Could you get me behind the answer and I'd love to go? He said, yes, but you have to get out yourself. I can get you there. I can't get you back. That's the end of it. They don't want to die, martyrs. They'd rather sit in a stuffy little thing or get two or three backslidden guitars and go around town making money. They don't want to suffer. Boy, I'm devastated when I think young people like that. I think he said we have five teams every year. We send them behind the anchor. One team, he said, this summer has been in Lebanon with all its shooting and all its killing and all its dangers. 
but they volunteered. We didn't ask them. Somebody said, I feel God wants us to go pray about it. I feel God wants me to go. And they sent them there, and they came back rejoicing. They weren't fun fans. They hadn't worshipped God devoutly for an hour in the morning with some nice guy talking it, and then played tennis the rest of the day. There's one group, if, 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 if you want to... If you want to uh, if you want to rough it smoothly, I'll give you the address of some boys in Dallas. They go to pray for revival in the hills of Switzerland, in one of the nicest hotels. And you can take your skis with you. And then they pray for an hour, then you go ski. And then you have a big fat lunch, and then you get on a train and you go through the tunnel. And go behind the iron curtain and buy leather goods, cheap, you know. And then solve your conscience at night after you skied another afternoon. And you pray at night, Our Father which art in heaven, thank you we didn't break a leg. They're so busy trying not, trying to not get a broken leg skiing, they don't care about a world that's got a broken heart. There's so much hypocrisy in the church today. So if you don't have time, here, go home and pray for those young folk like yourself that go behind the iron curtain, five teams that go. Pray for those fellows that say it doesn't matter. Let's pray. If you have an anointing, pray for the fellows away there in, uh, in that big, uh, what do you call it, cathedral in Leningrad. Or pray for the young people of a fire will really burst out of Portugal and come over the borders into Spain. We're always trying to design it. We'll take a little team. We'll fill our pockets with these little things, you know. God has a plan for your life. All you have to do is nod to God and you're in the kingdom. Forget it, it's hypocrisy. God demands the same of you as everybody else. Not just your lousy things, your commission, your life, your future. You're going to be a doctor, lay it on the altar, take it to the cross. You're going to be a lawyer, take it to the cross, if you want it to be that. You're better to be the least in his kingdom than the biggest outside of it. And remember, his kingdom is forever and forever and forever. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Let's remember the team up there in... Uh, the team's in New York. That, that really shook me up. I think, did I tell you last week about the guy that called me about running up the sidewalk? In uh, West 42nd Street, that's the middle road in hell. And he said, we're falling over each other's feet, giving out tracts. Oh, I'm from, I'm from Tulsa. I'm from Tulsa. They're giving out tracts. Now they've got little microphones. And they, they run at the side of you and say, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. He said you can't walk up West 42nd Street. You're falling over other kids that have come halfway across the nation. They never did the same. They didn't chase people who are damned and lost in their own town. But it's a thrill to go to New York. I'm not saying they shouldn't go. But when they're falling over each other, and he broke in tears. His daddy is one of the most famous preachers in the world. And he said, I had to call you, Brother Rainer. I'm so sick of walking up and down the street, giving out tracts morning, noon, and night. It's daylight 24 hours a day, they with artificial light. The street is full of transvestites, men with little skirts on and makeup, and perfu heavy perfume and handbags and wigs and all the other junk. And it's pimps and prostitutes, and everything is done openly the, at the side of the, the street. There are outlines of women in neon signs. Nakedness is advertised. Come up here, there's a nude colony. Come up here. And he said, Mr. Rennie, we're giving out thousands of tracts every week, and we're doing nothing. And these were his words. Mr. Rainey, what do we do when evangelism fails? I said, fast and pray till the Holy Ghost comes. I said, get hold of that book, Seven, what's he called? Seven Pentecostal Pioneers. Read the middle story there of Stephen Jeffries. Look at going to a town without any backing. Rent a hall, seating 2,000, not asking people to come and start the meeting. And within a week, he packed it to the rafters. And after that, people come out of the meeting at 10 o'clock at night, walk around the building and stand in line for the meeting next afternoon at, 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 at 3 o'clock. That's revival. It doesn't need finance. You don't need TV. You don't need radio. The Holy Ghost is the biggest attraction. I read a letter and I'm through this last thing. Somebody wrote to me recently, we're starting minds. We're teaching minds. We're teaching drama. We're reaching people that cannot be reached by any other thing. You're insulting the Holy Ghost. How did these men reach them? There's no TV and no mans and junk in the center of action. Young, young Philip goes out and it says that there's much joy where? In the house of those who were healed. In the synagogue, no, not in the house, not in the city. Where? In the city. The whole city was ablaze. 
He goes down the street and sees a man who's been at that street corner blind for ten years and he heals him. It becomes immediate gossip around town. That crippled man is walking, that blind man is seeing, that lame man is absolutely physically transformed. It's not the whole of the gospel, but it's a part of it. What's going to turn this nation around? Dear God, the last 25 years, I guarantee we've spent a billion dollars on TV advertising and meetings and, and radio. There are 3,000 gospel radios in America every day. And where are we? And England's much the same. Just the Leicester Square in England, it's comparable to West 42nd Street in America. It's full of filth, it's full of people falling into over each other, giving out facts. You know, we've almost pushed the Holy Ghost out of the picture. We're so full of flesh, so full of design, so full of trying to help God in our own feeble way. And he's waiting till we get to the place where we're naked, and we are naked in his sight. We're helpless. The nation goes to hell with all the evangelistic meetings we have and crusades, and what in the world do you have got, God? I, I said it, I'm sure I it. I said a few minutes ago, I said it for two years, the trouble is we do not, do not have one revivalist in the country. They're all, and you know what? I woke up this week and I, I wept over it. Not only do we not have one revivalist in America, we don't have one evangelist in America. Tell me one that fits into the feet. I don't care whether you go to Jimmy Taggart's College or you go to, uh, where is it there? Springfield. Or you go to Christ for the Nations. Tell me, where is an evangelist can go out without money and do, and, and he's a deacon only, he's not an ordained man, and go out with the anointing of God upon him. Go out like Stephen, the whole city shakes because of one penniless little guy that follows the despised man that those bearded old guys over there crucified. And yet he's willing to die at more than 20 years, less than 20 years of age. And the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It will take some bloodletting, I think, in America to really wake up the church. Get really persecuted for Christ's sake, and nobody likes that. And I don't, I know that. But again, you see, this God of Abraham is our God. He's the same yesterday, then, forever. And if there's something wrong in your house, check up. Are you the true father in the house? I will command, I will bless him because he commands his children. There's a curfew and they obey the, the curfew. There's a lifestyle and they fit into the lifestyle. They don't run the house. You rule it in love. And let's be sure we're not bringing to birth Ishmael. The biggest Ishmael that's been born is PTO. They knew what God could do in Azusa Street. They couldn't wait, so they put that playground up. And it's going to be a millstone round the neck. It's going to be a bonfire at the judgment seat. It's going to be the greatest gathering of wood, hay and stubble that anybody's done in 20 years in America. You may not like that. I'm not here to please you. I'm here to tell you the truth. I'd like to go to some other place in Thailand, but I won't get there. I know that. So you see, this is the guide book. Nobody's going to twist God's arm. Nobody's going to twist the scriptures. We're going to have to come humble and naked before him and say, God, I talk, I, I, I come with the rags of my ability. I come with the rags of my riches. I come with the rags of my vision. I come with the rags of my eloquence. Whatever I'm trusting in is rags in his sight. Let me get rid of them and say, Dear God, strip me naked that you may be released to bring blessing and joy and honor to, to my life. Honor and glory to, to your name. Let's remember then, where's Joe Foss? Anybody know? Giving the devil trouble somewhere, I don't know, sure. Pun? Anyway? Oh, good. Well, let's pray for Joe. Uh, when are the Indians going back to Oklahoma? Oh, next month. Good. Pray for Dave Wilkinson up in New York, and uh, I think there were 200 y living on Staten Island and coming on the ferry every day into New York. And I keep getting guys come in my office. I've been in New York two weeks. I've been in New York a week. That's good. How are you going to touch 10 million people giving facts out every day? You may get all the work.